and welcome to the second of our Discover SLM talks. I particularly want to extend a warm welcome to our members, donors and supporters. My name is Nerida Campbell and I'm the Acting Head of Curatorial at Sydney Living Museums. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and currently work. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Curators at SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we'll be sharing some of this research with you as we explore a range of subjects from food to the 1919 flu pandemic, from music to the historical use of colour to decorate Australian houses. So keep an eye out for future talks about your favourite subject or for the incurably curious Tune in every Tuesday at 12 to 12.30 for a new topic. There will be time for questions at the end of the talk, just to add them to the Zoom chat. Today's speaker is curator Dr. Carlin de Montfort, who began working for SLM at the front of house of the Hyde Park Barracks before joining the curatorial team as an assistant curator in the House Museum's portfolio. He has a PhD in Australian history based on the social and cultural history of recreational sailing in Australian waters. He's worked on a number of collection-based projects across SLM and loves the combination of hands-on curatorial work combined with research, interpretation and storytelling. He is currently the acting curator at the Hyde Park Barracks and has been working closely with its unique archaeology collection and it is insights from this work that he'll be sharing with us today. Thanks, Carlin. Okay, uh, thank you, Merida, and good afternoon. Um, I'm speaking today from Darug land, and um, I'll just share my screen now and get my presentation running. Okay, so good afternoon. I'm Carlin. Um, I'm currently acting curator at Hyde Park Barracks, um, a UNESCO World Heritage listed site on Gadigal land. It's one of 11 convict sites around Australia, um, collectively inscribed on this register. Um, and the building first provided accommodation for convict men in government working gangs from 1819 until 1848. But I'm not here today to talk about the building. I'm here to talk about the archeology span and to talk about over 120,000 artifacts that were found under the ground and below the floorboards in the central barracks building. And I'm here to take you a little bit behind the scenes to see where these objects take us. And this is a work in progress. It's unfinished research and these are unfinished stories. So one of the projects that I've been working on is to work through the objects in the collection and write what we call public access statements. And these are short who, what, where, why, when statements that go with the rest of the documentation that we have for each individual object. And as I've been going through these, I've been looking at objects that have text on them we have newspaper fragments, books, and then we have um, objects that have been intentionally marked. One of the most famous ones we've got is the convict shirt. It has the broad arrow and the letters B and O stamped on it for Board of Ordinance. And this is one of the things that identifies this as a convict shirt. But then there are even, there's an even more personal category and these are named objects. And these are artifacts that have been um, usually with ink written on by hand with an individual's name and these marks often indicate ownership. Now these um, named objects make up only a fraction of the archeology. span We have more than 12, but out of those 120,000 objects, it's a really, really tiny amount. But the collection at the barracks has more of these named objects than most archeological collections. And this is because of another key feature that makes our collection so special. And that is the enormous amount of material um, it's over half of the collection that was preserved in dry indoor spaces 
between ceilings and floors on the top two levels of the building. And we call these uh, underfloor deposits. And one of the things that makes these underfloor deposits so special is the type of material that survives there. The sorts of materials that might decompose in more typical underground deposits and contexts where you find a lot of historical archaeology, things like textiles, papers, organic materials, are the exact type of material that's actually survived well below the floorboards. And these are the so same sorts of materials that you can ink and write on and are the same sorts of things that tend to end up with individuals' names on it. So it's quite a special part, although a small part, of our collection that we have. And, and two of the most evocative of these marked objects have a convict's name on them. So it's a Bible and a prayer book, um, and they have the name Thomas Bagnall, and the date 1837 uh, is clearly marked on the inside cover that you can see here. Um, there are some other names and dates written on these, um, particularly on one of the inside covers, which has um, 1830 written on it, um, and it has um, pencil marks and a few other things, but we do know who Thomas Bagnall was. So Thomas Bagnall was an English brass founder. He was con convicted at 17 years of age for breaking into a warehouse. And he arrived in Sydney in 1838 on the Earl Grey. Um, the authorities, sometimes ship surgeons, could give convicts religious texts to pass the time during imprisonment or aboard the convict ships. And it appears like this is what happened in Bagnall's case. Um, uh, Bagnall didn't leave England until 1838. So there's a good chance that he actually received these books when he was imprisoned aboard the Hulks. Um, once in Sydney, the convicts from the Old Grey came to the barracks to be inspected and distributed for work. Um, and we think he stayed in the building, leaving these books behind. But there is a possibility that he traded them with other convicts and there might, might have been some other way that they ended up in the building. We rarely know with 100% certainty just how a certain object or item got into a certain place. So looking at Thomas Bagnall, when we see his um, indent, it says that he could read and write. Um, it says that he had a reputation as a bad character, but we do know that he was granted his ticket of leave in the district of Yass. So he might, must have behaved relatively well at some point. But Bagnall probably didn't deposit this Bible in its final sort of resting place, I guess, below the floorboards at Hyde Park Barracks. And this is because with some exceptions and significant exceptions, like examples of convict clothing, our underfloor deposits mostly tell us about the women who lived in the building after it was a male convict barracks. And on this slide here, we just have a little bit of the textile collection of you know, printed textiles um, that come both from um, the two uses that I'll tell you about next, the immigration depot and the female asylum. So in 1848, the building was renovated and it was reopened. This is after convicts were no longer in the building. It was renovated and reopened as a female immigration depot, which meant that it provided temporary accommodation uh, for single and unaccompanied women arriving in Sydney. And this is when new ceilings were installed. And this created those joist spaces below the ceilings and the floorboards where there's rich deposits of archeological material accumulated and where Thomas Bagnall's book diary, um, Bible and prayer book were found. Then in 1862, at the same time as the female immigration depot was here, a female asylum, which uh, provided accommodation for infirm and destitute women it meant it was a safe place for women who couldn't support themselves, occupied the top floor of the building. And so it means there's a good chance that Bagnall's Bible and prayer book were handled or used by these later occupants before ending up in their contexts. Out of named objects, a lot of them come from the asylum. And a lot of them come from the asylum dispensary. So the dispensary was a small building. It was built on the back of the barracks and it held the medicines, lotions and ointments uh, prescribed to inmates by the visiting doctor. But in most cases, um, it would have actually been administered by able-bodied asylum women uh, who carried out a lot of the work of the institution. 
we have some great descriptions of the conditions inside the um, dispensary building, uh, partly because of complaints from doctors. They complained of it being hot in summer, um, continuously damp, infested with rodents who chewed through the cork stoppers and uh, knocked the pharmacy bottles off the shelves, ruining a lot of the medicines. We have some of the pharmacy bottles and some of these fragments here with the labels from the uh, Hyde Park Asylum remaining on them. And then these are the objects that are then inked with individuals' names. So if you look here at these green fragments of glass bottles, they're flat. So they're consistent with uh, square case bottles, which uh, could have been used to hold medicinal gin or schnapps. Looking at these labels, particularly the one on the right, it's doubled up. And so this is meaning that this bottle was reused. So we can assume that it was to uh, dispense lotion at at least this point, but we can't say what was dispensed in it in the first place, or whether it was for the medicinal gin and schnapps that a bottle like this might have held, or if something else might have been um, replaced and used in the bottle. There's a little wooden disc as well, which is tiny. It's just a couple of centimetres across. And you can see that on the bottom left of your screen. Um, this could be from a match stick, a match, a match box. But looking at it here, it's likely that it was used as a makeshift dispensary label for ointment. So who are some of these women who are named on these objects? Well, some of them might have been in the first 150 or so inmates that were transferred to the Hyde Park Asylum when it opened from the benevol existing benevolent asylum. Um, and this is because we have records for this group. We do have a list of the um, first women transferred here. Um, so the Jackson on the wooden disc could be Margaret Jackson. On the fragment of the bottle to your right, it could be Francis Cunningham who come from these lists. But really, we don't know a lot about the individual asylum women, um, apart from these first inmates, as the admissions and departure records for the rest of the time that the asylum was open no longer exist. So we really do just get some of these fragmentary names. Um, on your top left, Alice Fry. Researchers did find a death certificate for her, and um, it tells us that she passed away at age 56. Her address on her death certificate is listed as the Hyde Park Asylum. We don't really know who Mrs. Harris was, apart from her name and the ointment being written on this small wooden label. But because our records are so sparse, the named objects, are, the names on these objects are even more important because these are rare physical links to named asylum inmates. But I want to spend a little bit more time talking about these. These are surgeons' requisition forms. They're not quite as evocative or beautiful as some of our other objects, but they are rich with the names of individuals. Um, we have three of these in the collection. There's two that I have on this slide. The one that's in the best condition is the one on the left. They're dated over three consecutive days from the 4th to the 6th of August, 1865. And the names and the doses remain nearly the same across all forms. So when I first saw these, um, I made a quick assumption that these were the names of women who all came through the immigration depot. But with a little bit more research and looking more closely at these forms, it's not exactly right. Um, right down on the right hand corner, it's, it's barely legible in these photos, but it says ship and it has the ship's name and ships, it was the General Paul Field. So this was a bark rig ship. It was around 650 tonnes, 47 metres long. So basically it was big and fast. It took only 82 days to reach Sydney, sailing non-stop. Um, to have achieved this, it must have sailed the Great Circle route that dived deep into the stormy latitudes of the Southern Ocean. It was a potentially uncomfortable route, but successful. Arriving in Sydney with 287 passengers, reporting no deaths, and in fact, one birth. The General Caulfield arrived on 12 October, 1865. So the ship was quite a long way from Hyde Park Barracks in August when these stores were requisitioned. 
the passengers aboard the General Corfield were what is important because these were assisted immigrants. They were families, single women and single men who had their fares subsidised by the colonial government. That meant that workers with suitable trades, um, often agricultural labourers labourers and domestic servants, could be specifically targeted for immigration based on the colony's needs. Significantly, there are two more passengers on this ship who are not assisted immigrants. That's the surgeon who actually filled out these forms, Dr Nichols, and the matron, Miss Darth Barker. And that's important because they are not crew. They were responsible for the health of the immigrants during this voyage. And they were not employed by the ship's captain or the ship owner. So the surgeon had to requisition this stout wine and brandy from the stores. And presumably the captain was reimbursed. We maybe know a little bit more about who some of these people named on the ship are because of passenger lists that are held by state records. And these are records that are available online. Our passengers on these lists are ordered by their status. So we see married families grouped together. We see single females grouped together, single males grouped together. And what you're looking at here on this page are the single female immigrants who most likely came through the immigration depot once they'd arrived in Sydney. And they're who I imagine is a typical female immigrant who might um, arrive in as an assisted immigrant, stay at Hyde Park Barracks, and then might find um, employment and accommodation through the hiring days that were actually held at the barracks in one of the large ground floor rooms. But when you look through these forms, you start seeing that there are different categories that are slightly smaller and more nuanced. So this is just one section from one of the pages. Looking up the top, we have a male convict, in uh, male convict immigrant, Geoffrey Keating, who's a widower. And then if you look below him, there's another category, widow and son. This is Bridget McGlynn, who's aged 50. And Bridget is on our list. She's described half a pint of stout by Dr. Nichols, the surgeon. She's accompanied by her son, though, who's 22. And so she didn't probably didn't pass through the immigration depot. And then below her, um, we see children of resident in the colony. And there's only one entry in this case, and it's a three-year-old, Margaret Fleming. So when I saw this, I was first alarmed uh, that a three-year-old might be travelling alone. But um, a quick email and a quick digging by our historian, Jane Kelso, found that she was travelling in the care of her 15-year-old cousin, Mary Lonegren. Um, and her relatives in the colony lived nearby in Woolloomooloo. So Margaret and Mary may have come to the immigration depot, or they could have been collected directly from the ship. It's hard to say. So as we're starting to look through the list of names, frustratingly, few of the women named on our surgeon's requisition forms are likely to have actually come through the immigration depot. When we search through the names, most of them, including Lucy Bambury, Penelope Hogan, Kath Redmond, Elizabeth Isabella Lancashire, and Mary Minor were married and traveled with their families. I did note that one of the married women on our list, Ravina Henry, was married and she travelled with six children and they were aged two to 11. So they were unlikely to come through the depot. They were travelling with their families and would probably be hired directly from the ships. But there were some who may have passed through the depot when we start looking at these names. Once Julia Hart, she was married and had relatives in the colony. She was also travelling with an infant under one. Jane, Jane Griffiths um, was single, but had relatives in the colony as well. So both of these women could well have come through the immigration depot. Another younger woman on the voyage was Bridget Hollins. She might have stayed at the immigration depot, but it's a little bit of a long shot. She was 17 and she traveled with her family, like the other women having relatives in the colony. She was traveling with her mother, Margaret, her brothers, Patrick and John, and her sister, Mary. Now this one's great because Mary was the infant born on the voyage. Now children of families sometimes stayed in the immigration depot to ease crowding aboard the ships once they'd arrived in Sydney. But at 17, Bridget would have been considered an adult. At 15, Patrick, 
uh, the eldest of her brothers may well have been considered an adult as well and may well have been considered as accompanying the family. So I really can't say that Bridget would have come through the immigration depot or not. But like I said, in some ways, these documents and these forms are a bit frustrating because when you think you're going to find the names of a lot of people who came through the immigration depot, there's actually only a handful. And sometimes it's a little bit tenuous as to whether they actually came through or not. Which starts to beg the question of what is this form and why is it in Hyde Park, in the Hyde Park Barracks of Archaeology and what then does it tell us? So these forms were probably associated with the agent for immigration who administered much of the immigration, assisted immigration in New South Wales and who had an office on the ground floor at the barracks. These forms probably came out of a book and I imagine there would have been pages and pages like this. If it's an 82 day voyage, um, I wonder where the rest of the forms are. Um, we also have other fragments of paper in the archaeology that probably came from the um, agent, for, agent for immigration as well. And for example, there are two blank notices of um, posters that advertised the arrival of immigrants. A bit like these blue surgeons forms, when you first look at it, you assume it's advertising the arrival of the single female immigrants who came through the immigration depot. But when you look closer, you see it's a little bit different. You can see just written in the middle here, male immigrants. Um, just off this form, it would have had um, families as well. Um, and then you can also see hired on board. So it's not got to do with the immigration depot at all, but it probably does have to do with the um, agent for immigration. That these documents survive and that they survive in the collection um, by chance is what makes them special. And they draw our archaeology into the greater context of assisted immigration to New South Wales. And they remind us that the archaeology is more than just what happened within the courtyard walls at the Hyde Park barracks. And so there's a little bit of a side story to finish off. And that is what happened to the general call field. Well, this was a convict ship and it could carry anything, not just passengers. And so in 1879, it was traveling west across the Atlantic to New York under the command of Captain Prentice. Now, Captain Prentice was washed overboard in a storm. It also carried away three of the ship's boats, a skylight, a fire engine, I assume they mean the pump by that, the bulwarks, which are timber rails at deck level. It limped into New York where it was loaded with a return cargo of grain and a new captain was found. But on this voyage, the ship was struck by heavy seas and knocked onto its beam ends. That means it was pushed over to 90 degrees. This caused the cargo to shift and was left listing the port to the left. It was knocked over three more times and apparently the charts were somehow lost. So the captain made for Queenstown in Ireland, County Cork, but struck a sandbar in the fog and the ship was wrecked. There is an eyewitness account from a Sarah Holman identified as an old age pensioner. This was an account collected by Irish school children who were recording folklore in the late 1930s. Some of the dates are a little bit out. The story of Captain Prentice being washed overboard appears conflict, conflated with the wreck on the Irish coast. But Sarah remembers the crew being saved by the local lifeboat and the grain being washed up from shore. And apparently for some months, poor residents from up to 30 miles away gathered on the coast to collect the cargo, some staying in outbuildings on local properties and others sleeping in caves on straw beds. So many of the women on the general call field, some of those who came through the immigration depot, others who hired directly from the ship, would have come from the same shores where the ship was eventually wrecked. And so it seems to me a dramatic but fitting end to the story of these named objects and some of the surprising places that they can take us. Thank you. Thanks, Carlin. It was fascinating. What bad luck that vessel had. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> I <know. laughs> uh, we've got some questions in the chat, which I'll feed through to you. Mm -hmm. So Glenda, who has two first fleeters, John Small and Mary Parker in her family tree, would like to know, do you have a list of convicts that are at the Hyde Park barracks? And if you do, where would it be available to be seen? Yeah, yeah. Um, we... 
we don't have a list of um, a publicly available list of convicts at Hyde Park Barracks, and we don't hold any records for convicts at Hyde Park Barracks that aren't held in other places. Um, so a lot of our convict records and a lot of our information come from state records. Um, and by searching through some of that, you might be able to identify that they uh, came through the barracks, um, particularly through um, censuses and musters and particularly the convict indents which might be saying that they were assigned as um, in the company in the government workforce and would have been at the barracks but if you're looking for first fleeters it's um, very unlikely nearly impossible that they would have come through the barracks later because the barracks didn't open until 1819 and by that point most of those first fleeter convicts would have been uh, moved on and living and working elsewhere in the colony. Thanks. Mark would like to know, when were the items, the Bible, the bottles, etc., retrieved? Yeah, 40 years ago, and 40 years ago right now. So in uh, 1981 was when the main archaeological dig was going. So if you went to Hyde Park Barracks exactly 40 years ago, uh, today you would have found a very busy site. Um, you would have found the Public Works Department doing some pretty major renovations and restorations, turning the building um, into a museum, uh, removing a lot of buildings, from, a lot of outbuildings from around the courtyard, and also working inside. And then um, you would have found archaeologists recovering objects from the trenches below the ground and from these under, under floor deposits as well. Um, and then, and then. That's not the end of the archaeology, but for 40 years since then, there's been a whole lot of work that's been done to it, a whole lot of um, cataloguing and research and a whole lot of work that leads us up to where it is today. Thank you. Um, Lynn would like to know, do any records remain for the infirm and destitute women? No, well, that's the tricky one. That's the, so, so before the government asylum opened in 1862, um, there was the benevolent asylum and that's where the first, it was around, it was 140 to 150 women who first came into the building and, and there's records from that benevolent asylum that still exist. So we know the discharges and we know who was transferred and came over to the barracks, but we don't have what must have existed, um, being the, the, the discharges and the admissions to the asylum itself. So we actually, we actually just don't have them which is you know, one of the reasons why I think some of these named objects are really important, even though they're quite fragmentary and we don't necessarily know the full story of who they are, but it's, it's quite rare actually to have some of those names. Um, but a, but a, lot of, a lot of women would have come through that institution and lived at the barracks. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question too. Um, once we're out of this lockdown, can you see any of these marked objects at the Hyde Park barracks? Absolutely, and that's a fantastic question. Yes, you can see um, uh, pretty much all of the ones that I've talked about. Um, I, I, I think they're pretty much what those ones are on display. Um, we do have we do have other ones marked objects that are um, in storage. A lot of those actually stored on site at the barracks in our archaeology store there. But yeah, a lot of these marked objects are on display um, and a lot of re other really interesting and um, significant objects from um, all those three periods that we talk about in the museum, the convict period, the immigration depot and the asylum. And Sarah would like to know where were these forms found under the floorboards? Okay. I have a question around that. <laughs> the forms, um, so they were found, um, one of them is, listed as unstratified, which means we don't know the exact context that it was found, but we know that it comes from level two. Um, the other two forms, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, they came from level two, um, which was used for the immigration depot, but level two also had the accommodation of the matron who was doing a lot of the administration and running of the building as well. Um, I, I cannot remember the exact context, but, not, but they weren't necessarily all found together. But, but close, but it is interesting that they are three consecutive days, yeah. Julia would like to know, and this is probably our last question, have the dress fabrics been dated? The colours are very vivid. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of these have been cleaned. Um, they've been sent to conservatives, some have flattened out and cleaned. And, um, and again, these are a lot of the things that you can see on display in the building. Um, it's, it would take more research from my end, and I'm not an expert on textiles we do have other experts on textiles 
at Sydney Living Museums. So some of those patterns can be dated. I don't have them, I have them off the top of my head, um, but they do come from that um, period in the 19th century where synthetic dyes were invented and you had uh, roller printing. And so these kind of fabrics became really widely available and uh, relatively cheap as well. Um, so, so it is possible, it's not something that I've done. Okay, well, thank you so much, Carlin. And for those of you in the chat who've got burning questions that we couldn't get to today, you can send them through to Carlin at um, the email address askacurator at slm.com.au and we'll get back to you. Thanks for joining us today. Next week at Tuesday, we're going to have Dr. Matthew Stevens, who will talk to us about music in our houses. Thank you.